welcome you on behalf of the Reza Foundation and the India International Center to this 12 month long series starting in the 150th year of Mahatmagali. And this is the inaugural lecture. Uh, we are hoping that every month between including this one, 12 months, you have a multiplicity of views on Gandhi, his life, vision, his influences, his relevance, or his irrelevance, his true meaning for us today, his failures, etc. And we have a number of people, not necessarily all of them Gandhians, but some of them may be. And many of us are turning later day Gandhians because there seems to be no other way out from the turmoil in which we are caught. And some of the themes that might come up in this series are truth in those truth times, non-violence in violent ethos, aesthetics of simplicity and austerity, the political, the spiritual, the religious, duties of despair, architectures of hope, a new civil disobedience, presence and absence of Gandhi, the loneliness of Gandhi, the last days, Gandhi in the world today, etc. And we have, we are very grateful to Professor Ashish Nandini for having agreed to deliver this inaugural lecture in the series. In many ways, he is not only an outstanding intellectual, he is also a dissident intellectual who had dared to uh, keep on himself in perpetual dissent. The views on Gandhi, secularism, Hindu psychology, and mind, culturally parts of Asia as distinct from the Western ethos, etc., on violence. He has been very courageous, candid, and has presented arguments based on robust, robust analysis. Now, it is perhaps appropriate that when in this country Dissent is being undermined, both sometimes constitutionally and many times extra constitutionally, sometimes anti constitutionally, that we should go back to Gandhi and think of dissent in new ways. Gandhi himself was a dissenter, and of course, you hear from Mr. Gandhi who tell you the greater detail. He was a political dissenter in the sense that he led an unarmed, non-violent struggle for freedom against a violent empire in an age of unprecedented violence and genocide. That was the 20th century. He was a social dissident with an insistence on the abolition of untouchability to the point of rejecting Vedas if they supported it. He was a religious dissident who said all religions are true, but they are all imperfect. <coughs> he was a dissident in insisting on dual purity, both ends and means. And his insistence of total transparency public and a personal conversion. So here was a great center, and we have a dissenting intellectual, so that I can ask you to Over to you, I think that's fine. Mr.
मुझे क्या देखना Okay, uh, I must tell you that I am deeply honored that I have been requested to start off this series. I will not aim to preempt anybody. Everybody has the right to speak on Gandhi, even though in most cases you will probably hear a rather standardized vision of the old man. Uh, I like very much one of the themes Ashok mentioned, namely the loneliness of Gandhi. I could have at also called this presentation or, or a presentation on Gandhi's loneliness because talking of Gandhi's descent is impossible without first admitting that he was a lonely person for a very long time in his life, particularly in his last days, of course, but also otherwise. As early as in the 1930s, Sir Shankaran Nayar, a rather well-known figure in India at that time, said that this man stands against everything the great sons of India taught us in 19th century. Um, and Gokhale, whom Gandhi called a guru, said, let him spend a few years in India. He will himself burn his book, Hind Swaraj. Uh, and Gandhi, of course, didn't do that. In fact, in his last days, a non-Indian journalist, somebody from the, I think, United States, asked him, that in Hind Swaraj you had mounted a severe attack on modern civilization. In what way would you like to change it? Something of that kind. And Gandhi said, I would not change even one word. There is no doubt that his stance at a critic of modernity itself and not only a critic, a radical critic of modernity, distinguished himself from virtually every major figure in Indian public life and even a huge majority of the intellectuals. About eight or nine years ago, there was a survey in India of all the all the uh, I mean sorry, in India which asked the question amongst the Indians who do you think was the greatest in modern times 71 percent I think said that it was Gandhi A large number of votes were also given to Mother Teresa and Indira Gandhi. But I think both of their figures were in the 50s. You can see the difference. So the first thing we have to meet is this contradiction between Gandhi, as the, a majority of Indians saying it, that he there was the greatest son of India or greatest child of India in, that, uh, in modern times and Gandhi people person after person saying that he is dangerous, his ideas are dangerous, they, they, they challenge the very basis of our struggle to have, uh, have a future India. He is jeopardizing the future of the country itself. I think the best way to start, I only spoke a little bit about this area in last week in the annex in connection with a book discussion. So
So, but I will have to repeat it for this audience. Uh, let us start with one of his most aggressive critic, Sabarkar. Sabarkar flawed Gandhi for three reasons and he spells it out in his writing. It is not a speech, it is writing. First, he thought Gandhi was superstitious. First, he thought that Gandhi was superstitious because he brought into politics things like soul force and fasting. Two, he was anti-science because he not only did he openly criticize modern science, but he also didn't believe that modern science can liberate India. And three, that he is totally unacquainted with modern European political theory. It can may be argued that Gandhi was great because of exactly these three reasons, but that's another story. I'm not going to going into it. I'm giving the criticism. I'm supplying you the criticism. But I do want to say that on the third point, that Gandhi, yes, Gandhi did not read many of the modern, or I might not have read probably most of the modern thinkers on political philosophy or political, political theory. Savarkar was a scholar, he had translated Matsuri and his concept of the nation state was modeled on Matsuri's. If it doesn't, it doesn't hide that fact. If you read it, it becomes clear. But Gandhi didn't borrow a word from them. But I also want to suggest to you that Gandhi was perhaps best acquainted intellectually with the dissenting thinkers of Europe. And living in the, at the age of colonialism, but colonialism was not only globally dominant, it has let loose what might be called the second version of globalization. First version was the modern slavery, uh, Atlantic slave trade, because it was a four continent slave trade. And, and colonialism was a five continent or six continent global affair. So that was the first, uh, second attempt to globalize the world. This now it is, the third attempt is going on. I propose to you that the, it was in some ways incumbent on Gandhi to, to, uh, to challenge the ideological and philosophical basis of the newly emerging forces of colonialism. Then, still. He was perhaps more un most unequivocal when he talked of when we, uh, we talked of the East and the West, or Europe and the rest of the world, and that boga, uh, robust skepticism of modern civilization, modern European civilization and attempt to locate his worldview in contradic uh, in, as a counterpoint of this new globalized worldview, modern European worldview, is the key to his descent. Savarkar was not alone. In the heart of arts, every modern India carries the same doubt, same skepticism, and same suspicion of Gandhi. 
and to, towards the end of his life gandhi had to confront that fact the loneliness was complete in the last few weeks of his life i think that point should be made very very clear that is because by that time a substantial substantial strain of the colonial world view which came to india through modernism many people talk of modernity as something which came to us through the west and through colonialism i think it is time for us to look at it the other way when colonialism when came from partly modernity because this colonialism modern colonialism was different from the kind of colonialism portugal and spain had pioneered that form of globalization that was a marauding culture there were after money gold and women but the modern colonialism felt that it was performing a civilizational duty in taking on in taking on the responsibility of introducing entire civilizations to a more correct view of the world more correct view of human potentialities and a, a, a vision of the future that will be accessible to all what europe is today the rest of the world will become tomorrow if they are intelligent and we have purchased this purchased this i often say that most good your indians when they die will go to new york is a model on oscar wilde saying that most good englishmen when they die go to paris so ours is an improvement on that i guess but that's a different thing this introjection of that world view that taken place yeah. and therefore even persons who seem to be or seem to be his admirers had great doubt of his world vision jawaharlal nehru at least in two or three letters wrote to gandhi bapu you are far greater than your little books he wanted not to go near this books he felt that he was being kind to gandhi because gandhi the freedom fighter was greater than his little books if i may point out to you uh, i was a great admirer of jawaharlal nehru he seemed so modern and so elegant in his english which which was the kind of english we were taught now i find it more difficult to read jawaharlal nehru is english it is still very nice and very lucid but there is a touch of edwardian english in it already come that means time is catching up with it if you read gandhi that you won't get that feeling at all it is biblical english of a kind which is specifically timeless so even there and it doesn't seem dated indeed there is it is not a surprise to me that also the major commentaries in india today have come on gandhi in the last 10 years in fact some some of the best of them have come out in the last 10 years i don't think anybody has tried to do that kind of a thing with nehru but that's a, a by way of a digression i am not i am just telling you that even in in his amongst his admirers there was a clear clear attempt to split him as a leader of a movement for freedom and as an intellectual envisioning the future of india i might also say that in our times already many of the people looking at the human future will consider him more impressive than 
many of the others who at one time seemed more relevant. My favorite story is one letter from Marx to Engels or Engels to Marx. I have the reference in my writing, but I, uh, I cannot remember exactly. It's the exchange of letters between Engels and Marx after Algeria was conquered by France. So, I think I, Engels write to Marx about this and Marx says, good, that Algeria has entered, you know, has been conquered by France. It will now enter civilization. Anybody acquainted with the history also of Mediterranean, Mediterranean area, both the European and North African and so on and so forth, will know that Algeria has a history of not less than 2000 years. France's history began later. It was a tribal settlement of a number of tribes. But that's a different. I don't want to push these points very much. But this was the kind of concept in one of the persons who was fighting for human liberation, who was empathetic with the colonized people, who knew that they were victims of oppression and violence, but also felt that this is this has this they have to come out of their present state by internalizing Europe's technique and Europe's worldview, Europe's science and technology. I want to at this point uh, also point out to you one personal experience which I went through. This also I did mention there, you know that many years ago, I decided that I will not look critically at minor instances of social institutions. I will look at they are most powerful incarnations. Like for example, everybody can criticize the village astrologer telling you your future and cheating you of 20 bucks. And that is seen as very condemnable, very superstitious, taking advantage of naive villagers. Nobody talks about the billion dollar business of cosmetics, which promises you eternal youth. Because it's a billion dollar business. It is not superstition. Yeah? So, so, I would always go for these major visions. So, I am willing to accept some of the great discoveries of science, but I shall also look at, not at traditional science, which access was limited and which in any case people now think is no good or at least began to add now things that times are changing but when I started they used to think that these were all superstitious uh, uh, without any empirical support whatsoever. <coughs> but, but I shall also look at his negative sides. So, I started with modern science because that is more powerful. It's globally powerful. And who cares about Chinese acupuncture or Indian Ayurveda? Yes, yes, now it is a growing, there's a growing clientele for that. But mostly people think it as a kind of an additional security against health or a nice little thing to experiment, bath, bath experimenting with in these days. But few take it as seriously as they take modern medicine, modern agriculture practices and so on. 
So I wanted to see that part of the story, that part of them. And I must tell you that I found one or two things which to me seemed important. I thought, I found that in modern science, all the great discoveries get the scientists and the sponsors of such research excellent dividends. Let me give you a great example. <clears throat> the first antibiotic was dis discovered by Alexander Fleming, penicillin. He got a Nobel Prize for that and died a famous man, became immortal. It took me more than 25 years to find out who discovered Xylon B, the poison gas which was used by Germans to kill a little less than a million victims. Concentration camp in inmates, the gas chambers. It took me 25 years. When I happened to be in Germany, I began to ask people and got into the right book to get the access to that, that information. The negative discoveries of science are orphans. They have no human agency behind them. They are the fault of American imperialism, Soviet dictatorship, political economic systems, greed of corporate sector, all general institutional terms are descriptions. Nobody personally is responsible. Nobody holds the discoverers themselves as culpable. So that's the world we, in which we live. So I just give these as examples. <coughs> and I must tell you that as a young Bengali teenager, very skeptical about Gandhi and uncomfortable with his lifestyle, ethical preferences, his non-violence, <coughs> and even his aesthetics. I, uh, I had no reason to go into, look into Gandhi's work and read him carefully or read his life for that matter more carefully. It took me many years gradually when searching for a voice to formulate my criticisms that I suddenly discovered that all these have already been anticipated and more than nearly 70 or 80 years before me, here was a man not known as an intellectual, not known as a thinker, but an active political scholar whose nonviolence is praised and loved, <coughs> but whose intellectual ab abilities are never mentioned. There had been an embarrassment earlier that now he had something to say and has said it already. It is not an accident. I don't think it is an accident. There is a different kind of explanation that we do not, did not want to know that, that Gandhi. We wanted to know the Gandhi, the freedom fighter. We wanted to know the Gandhi who preach the doctrine of non-violence. But we also in the heart of our felt that this cannot work at all in modern times, in our times. <clears throat> and I must say that this awareness was beautifully captured in a play by Prasanna, which was staged in Delhi many years ago. In, it's a play on Gandhi. And 
mean Gandhi and Anthuram Godse are the two major characters. But both the characters are played turn by time by all the other actors. I think he's trying to make the point, which at least I want to make, is this that Gandhi and Nathuram Godse, you can make it Savarkar also, doesn't matter, are two potentialities within us and within all modern Indians. And you can contain one for a while, but you cannot erase it out of us easily. And all we can do, and perhaps we should try to do, is to have that awareness and accept the responsibility of living with both and ensuring that one dominates the other and one, the other, one remains recessive. I also say this because the critics of Gandhi has also used, uh, included very uh, very reputable people and critics have also included persons who had no, no particular reason to be hostile to Gandhi. I, I, I started with an example of somebody like M. N. Roy who read, read, uh, wrote three essays on Gandhi. First one was a savage critic, second was a moderate critic and third was slightly positive estimate. More as his, and there's a trajectory he followed, as his hope in the whole of India for his radical humanist creed gradually faded and became a small esoteric cult almost. He, they also, they, it became uh, probably more and more obvious to Roy that Gandhi had something to do with deciding the future of India. At least he could mobilize Indians in a way which we, who have the larger interests of the countries at our mind, uh, because we are better informed empirically about our knowledge of the country and knowledge of the globe, but we cannot move people on that downs. Here, here is a man who can do so. So there is also a, a reluctant, I would say, a, a diffident respect for Gandhi backward. I had the privilege, if I may say so, of interviewing two of the killers of Gandhi for a long time. I mean, by training, I was a clinical psychologist with a psychoanalytic bend. I generally try to spend as much time with person I'm interviewing um, uh, as a <coughs> he or she is willing to give me. And I allow them to usually also pattern the interview in the sense, shape it. I talk very little. I say, I want to know about your life and you know, because I want to find you, I want to meet you, I have met you, but I want to meet you as a person. I want to understand you sympathetically or empathetically. So I interviewed two of them, Gopal Gandhi and Madanlal Pawa. Madanlal Pawa was also interviewed by Sikha Trivedi because he, he was going through dialysis and sometimes I would go come all the way from Delhi and in Bombay to Bombay and find that he couldn't give me time because his dialysis interfered. So ultimately I had to give it Sikha uh, Trivedi, uh, not Sikha Trivedi, Rajini Bakshi uh, the responsibility of interviewing him. Anyway, in both these cases, I had very interesting um, experience. Gopal Godse was very balanced and, and composed. 
no abuses no bitter comments but very steadfast in his hostility to gandhi and hostility was well reasoned he was a true disciple in that sense of savarkar who was a brilliant man in many ways so he didn't have to raise his voice at all but i did get what i wanted about the family background the whole background from which they came and so on and so forth madan lal pawa was a punjabi much more direct and much more open relaxed and also much more um, i was a frank he started by abusing gandhi uh, from his hair brand ideas about india and his future and for his politics and as the days went on <coughs> i mean on the beginning for example he said that he celebrated the fact that he was in the in that, in that group which murdered gandhi he says he was proud of it he has done it for the country not for himself he said that the when policemen in the jail came to him because he was caught after he was the one who threw a bomb five days before gandhi's assassination and was arrested by the police immediately so the police he got the news through police that gandhi had been assassinated and he said i was so happy that the bastard has died bola my police unko bola i told the police officer theek hua sala ko maar diya honi wala tha and towards the end of my interview at the end of say a long period not was the end he gradually has begun to open up to me and began to say things which i am sure he will not say to his political colleagues his admirers and fan club he began to say about how that he was no longer that man who killed gandhi because he was now old and a humanist he began to justify his change and said things about his birthplace in montgomery district in pakistan where <coughs> it was close to a huge mosque of baba farid how life was then those were the best years of his life and the muslims were a very cultivated family uh, sorry not kind of community cultivated if you have to learn manners and good tazib you have to go to the muslims and gandhi could have been a great leader he had all the qualities except that he wanted to be the peer of muslims that there, that was that, that and he he said that though that whatever i did was at that time when i was young it is the work of a young man now i am different and the way he argued and the justifications he gave were partly gandhian so i giving this example that many people of the critics also have had a illustrious career i can give a similar example from dambudipat Nambudripad also wrote three, three times on Gandhi. The first one is a crude, ultra-positivist, Leninist diatribe, more or less. Not diatribe, Nambudripad was not capable of diatribe, but a total rejection. The second one is a different kind of thing. You know, he's opening up. And the third one, partly, is more recent. He's also a critic, but he's a very well-formulated critic. without a sense of as if somebody is offending you and you are going to take taking him and speaking back to him no there has change i think nambudri path also perhaps i will find out some day he died are too early for me to go and interview him but if i i would have found that he also probably had gone through a different process 
of encountering Gandhi. In case of Mayawati, I don't have to do the interview. He gave, gave a savage critique of Gandhi. She gave a savage critique of Gandhi. You know, when she started career in politics soon after that. But now, she doesn't talk about the subject at all. I would like to find out why. Because as you have developed pan-Indian vision and pan-Indian ambitions also, you come to also recognize that it is not easy. It not, it's not easy to handle these Indians. They are as slippery <coughs> as the sands of Jovana sipping through a finger. This was my friend um, uh, Girilal Jain's justification why we needed somebody, some a group like the BJP ruling India because uh, the, these Hindus are notoriously fickle and you cannot control them. That there is a strong anarchy streak in Devatodwa. It's like sands of Amna seeping through your fingers when you try to pick it up. It doesn't hold together. Hmm. So, then it is in that context that he could mobilize the country on his behalf, or for his causes. And I propose to you that it is bound, it was bound to invite, if not jealousy, uh, uh, maybe in some sense of awe in some, but also a certain bitterness that though we have a better theory, though we are in better church with modern political science, though we have better empirical instruments to find out about the polity, nonetheless, this man had an intuitive feel for it, which is somehow more successful than what we had. Um, and I also want to say, that, go back to the point I made here, that Gandhi's acquaintance with European dissenters, which I mentioned but did not elaborate, I want to say two, three words for you on, on that, is so impressive that because nobody in India was reading them. He, decla they, he declared three persons to be his gurus and all three were Europeans. <laughs> Tolstoy, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau and Ruskin. One can perhaps say that he would have perhaps would Emerson if he had by that time read him because he was a great admirer of Emerson too. But I don't want to go into that. It is surprising that Gandhi was, had read them very thoroughly and in the case of Tolstoy had exchanges of letters with him. But also that he was in excellent touch with the American um, black movements. Many of them had come to meet him here. He was in excellent touch with some of the trade union leaders in England. He was in excellent touch with the, some of the dissenting scholars in working for or peace activists. In, you know, Marala is an obvious example, everybody knows about that. And I believe that that reference group helped him not to be cowed down by the dominant worldview and dominant structure of globalism that has gradually begun to go into, come into India and getting introjected by the Indian elites. It is also true that Gandhi rejected radically the theory of progress. And because the theory of progress at that time, now it is a little different, situation is changing perhaps. But at that time, 
the theory of progress was deeply intertwined with social evolutionism of various kind. Everybody talked of stages of history. Everybody talked of stages of economic growth, economic prosperity. Everybody talked of uh, stages in civilizational uh, 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 changes. Everybody liked to talk of change in, in through social evolutionary means. This is Darwin's influence. Uh, das Capital was dedicated to Darwin. And, but I am not talking only of social Darwinism. In every sphere of life, social evolutionism has entered. So even the individual life cycle, social evo evolutionism has entered. If you read histories of childhood, yes, those are also available. Nobody reads them here in India. But histories of childhood also are available. You will find how the situation of the child and the women change in Europe. Colonialism always takes a toll, not only of the colonized. Everybody knows that. We always feel aggrieved by our past. But colonial, Sachi Tharoor has forgotten to mention that. Colonialism also takes a heavy toll of the colonizers too. Because you have to organize a small country like Great Britain, one-seventh the size of India. Probably now, roughly one. That would be there. Might be even less. Might be even less now. Which was controlling such a vast empire, and that had to be. That had to be through not only rebuilding and reconstituting the British character, but also introducing new language to justify that. If you read the history of childhood in Victorian England, the chimney boys, the practice of exchanging children as domestic servants so that the child learns to work diligently and the master serve can are harsh on them like any other, you know, whereas the parents will be too tolerant and tolerate, no, uh, tolerate many of their failures. Will more nurturing. The whole concept of the child as only an incipient adult being prepared for the adult life was the cornerstone of Victorian concept of childhood. In fact, that concept of childhood has entered India in a big way. It came in 19th century, but now is a dominant mode. Everybody is preparing for what the child will become. This in a society where childhood was itself celebrated for its touch of sacredness and the divine and its mix of innocence and uh, warmth and spontaneity. It is Rajan Krishna, Krishna is a Raj king, Rajan, who lags behind Bala Krishna, which is more sacred. Bala Krishna is more sacred in this society than Krishna. If you really go back to the medieval Europe, that was the case with medieval in Christendom too. And it comes from the Bible. Childless citadel of innocence and spontaneity and a symbol of creative, human creativity and potentialities. But things changed dramatically then. The notorious English public schools came into being there, which produced Radial Kipling. I have described that somewhere else. Similarly, the role of women changed. His, you are like a woman, is all became an abuse. Masculinity became a new revalued concept. Huh? 
سو دا ان ون سینس دا سیکنڈ کلاس سٹیزن شپ آف وومین دا بیسس فار اٹ واز لیڈ ڈاؤن ڈیورنگ کالونیل ٹائمس اینی ایس دس دس تھنگس آئی ہیو ریٹن ایلز ویئر آئی ڈونٹ وانٹ ٹو گو ان ٹو اینی گیٹ دس ٹائم واٹ آئی ایم ٹرائنگ ٹو سی از دس دیٹ ایچ آف دس کرٹیزمس ایچ آف دس کرٹیزمس آف انڈین سویلائزیشن واز ریجیکٹیڈ آؤٹ ٹرائڈ بائی گاندھی بیکاز ہیز رائٹنگ از اے سیلیبریشن آف دا انڈروجائن Um, I, I, I often put it in a formal-like fashion that Gandhi accepted the lessons of the Puranas and medieval Bhakti movement and Sufi movements that no man is complete without the touch of the woman in him and no woman is complete without a touch of the man in him or in her. It is that, that, you know, which now has become one of the findings of how, what contributes to human creativity. It might just from a study of Nobel laureates and great architects and artists and printers from that. Anyway, that, that, that's another, another story. So it is in this kind of way in the, uh, that, this kind of way, that Gandhi's Descent was not only from the authorities, political authorities, but it was a descent from the standardized means of opposing political authorities. It was a descent from also the concept of what constitute true descent. And hence the bitterness of many who feel that their life's work is being belittled or being thrown into the dustbin of history. That was the feeling on many revolutionaries too in India. And in that, in the, in that kind, that tradition, Gandhi has no place. <coughs> I might try to end this presentation by pointing out one aspect of Gandhi of which Gandhi himself might not be that, might not have been that self-conscious. Because he, that, that was his not job to do philosophical speculation. He didn't look at it that way. It is this, that at the moment, I would like to put it in contemporary terms. The Indic civilization and its needs, its core values and core principles, I should say, more than core values, are in increasing, growing clash with the values centering around the Indian nation state. The Indian nation state, like the nation states in th this part of the world, or in, for that matter in Asia and Africa, are faced this, this dilemma that their concept of what good life is, according to traditions, according to the other side, the kind of values of the civilization they live in are not the same with the nation state endorses or is willing to willing to compromise on. Now in a clash between a nation state and a civilization, nation states always lose out. This is the experience of time. Nation states are quite flimsy if you look at it. Even great nation states have gone, undergone enormous changes. Now, by our concept of time, it may, may look very permanent, but, but at the moment, 
we are ruled by a global system which recognizes the nation state as the crucial units of it i have no problem with that if you have to survive in this world you have to take into account what your nation states can do and use that nation state but you cannot therefore therefore uh, sanctify nation state as beyond criticism and beyond dissent or beyond beyond analysis and i do think at the moment we are facing a situation where nation state has become increasingly something sacred something which you cannot criticize without being accused of being unpatriotic or the actual good I mean, anti national but national but what national comes from 17th century europe it is not a very old world in europe either europe was satisfied with patriotism it is only when the when the nation states came in that they would have the concept of a nationality and in an a nation and nationalism but that's a, i want to suggest to you that this clash in india is extremely difficult clash to handle if you are a practicing politician or even if you are a practical thinker and i would propose that one way of looking at it is to look at the way people have handled this problem how they have reconciled that too because they are not reconcilable i i think of the six major philosophical systems of india two are clearly anarchist not in the sense in which european anarchism in the 19th century became a news maker but i am talking of a philosophical anarchism which somebody else has called gentle anarchism in the case of gandhi i forget who and this philosophical anarchism of vedanta buddhism and perhaps also vishishta advaita perhaps it also inflects in some way uh, parts of tantra too this you have to recognize and make a space for itself in your cultural configuration political cultural configuration not as a central piece not center piece but some play for that which will allow you to decentralize without fear of getting uh, Uh, get, getting fragmented without fear of all your neighbors trying to trouble you know they may be trying to harass you or harming you and therefore becoming in effect increasingly a garrison state and also fearing dissent also within the country many of the people who were arrested in this some of some of the people been many you know, arrested in connection with this five arrest in intellectuals and the, if you if you look at it the fate of some of the gandhian also like um, the person who gandhi gandhi ashram in chatisgarh was bulldozed overnight not in bjp's time but in upa in upa times uh, himanshu kumar Yeah. so there is this fear and anxiety about gandhi because they recognize more than we do that there is a strong element of philosophical anarchism or how put it mildly gentle anarchism in him and i think that nobody can rule this country without recognizing and giving space 
to that philosophical anarchism if he or she was to rule the country. I think our most uh, more astute politicians, more astute leaders have know this. But politics also is changing. It is no longer the Gandhian times. It is a politics which is much more dependent on the media system than on representation of the system itself by becoming a district com uh, head of the district committee of BJP or Congress. You cannot hope to aspire to become a regional leader and from regional leader to national leader. You have to make a direct appeal to the electorate bypassing the representational system. Uh, and therefore, you need more and more a centralized state. In this centralized state, the pace of you must handle dissent as a dangerous luxury for the intellectuals and the writers and the painters. And we are seeing that fear of dissent everywhere. It was not BJP who have said that nationalism is the greatest uh, threat to India's security. It was said by Manmohan Singh. And everybody knows, in this, I doubt, doubt whether in this room anybody does not recognize that nationalism is a direct product of 70 years of neglect of India's Adivasis. And this is a desperate last stand of the tribal population of India to resist what is they may know almost certain to come to them, namely doom. And it is probably right that they are in the desperation, they, what they are doing is probably not, would, would, might not have been very pleasing to Gandhi either. But we also know it is a bloom, doomed struggle, but we also know that the logic from which it has grown cannot be handled by crushing this movement only through force of arms. May I tell you a story at the end? Two minutes. The f two, actually two, I will write. One, it is said the Gandhian system did, will not work, non-violence will not work. It was tried against Nazi Germany only once. And it succeeded. There's a book on that, Rosenstrasse, famous Rosenstrasse case. It was succeeded. That's one. And second is something which Nirmala Deshpande, the late Gandhian freedom fighter, and an activist told me that once she was going to Jammu and Kashmir and she thought <coughs> she will go and meet General Krishna Rao who was then staying in Pune after retirement. He said, I am going to Kashmir and taking Gandhi's message to him the Kashmiri militants and I wish you will tell me whether I shall succeed in, in this mission because I have to tell them something that yes this will bring you more, more success than you are getting now to the use of arm, arm, arms. Krishna kept quiet. He was, he was a retired CNC of Indian Army. He kept quiet for quite a few seconds and then said, I hope you are, you are patriotic enough not to go and give them this message because you might succeed and they might succeed. Thank you very much for your patience.
Thank you. Any questions? I don't think there's a... Well, friends, uh, we come to the end of this evening. You've heard a brilliant, slightly meandering, <coughs> but no. still robustly on the path of argument and facts about dissent in Gandhi and how can it be made use of even now when I think the only duty of despair could be dissent. Loya said duty, there are duties of despair, and I think in these times there are duties of despair which can emanate only from dissent. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Professor Ashish Nandi, for being with us this evening. Yes, it's become a little meandering. I should have organized right. it better. It's all right. It's all right. Mm -hmm. That's your style. <laughs> You're not giving a scholar.